<clears throat> Good evening. Good evening. He is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Welcome to the Lord's house as we gather together around his wonderful good gifts of his word and his sacrament of holy communion. A couple of announcements as we continue. First of all, I want to share the sad but joyful new news that the Lord has seen fit to call our beloved sister in Christ, Jean Cook, to himself in heaven. You may remember that her husband, Jim, passed away in February earlier this year. And so we certainly want to keep uh, Jean's family in prayers, uh, but also rejoice with them, knowing that she's with the Lord and reunited with her beloved husband. Some information about that. There will be a service of celebration at Young Funeral Home on Saturday the 31st, the 31st at 2 p.m. And there will be a viewing from 1 to 2 on that day. So if you're able to, uh, certainly attend. And if not, uh, keep the family in prayer. Also, <clears throat> just uh, to be aware that we have reverted everything now back to our pre-COVID status. So just so that you're aware of some things uh, that have changed back. First of all, as we normally do on Thursdays, uh, the plate is back there for the offering, and so you can place that back there. You'll notice there aren't any slips of paper anymore on the pews. So, but you will notice that the attendance pads are there, and so just use those uh, as we did before the whole world um, had a great problem, right? So be aware of that. As well, uh, with Holy Communion, we will we will proceed as we did before you'll notice there aren't any more dots anywhere on the carpet and so we'll have um the the bread and the wine here um and and so you can come and you can receive that uh and that that and then just return on the outside so all right um any questions i'm gonna be kind of informal for a minute about that before we continue okay we're glad that you're here and we'll continue with our opening hymn We continue on page 184 on the front of our hymnals, 184, Divine Service, Setting 3, Confession and Absolution. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. beloved in the Lord, let us draw near with a true heart and confess our sins unto God our Father, beseeching him in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ to grant us forgiveness. Our help is in the name of the Lord. Amen. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord. And you forgave the iniquity of my sin. O Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a poor, miserable sinner, confess unto you all my sins and iniquities with which I have ever offended you 
and justly deserved your temporal and eternal punishment, but I am heartily sorry for them and sincerely repent of them, and I pray you for boundless mercy and for the sake of the holy, innocent, bitter sufferings and death of your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, to be gracious and merciful to me, a poor, sinful being. Upon this, your confession, I, by virtue of my office as a called and ordained servant of the word, announce the grace of God unto all of you. And in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. You open your hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. Sing to the Lord with thanksgiving. Make melody to the Lord on the lyre. He covers the heavens with clouds. He prepares rains for the earth. He makes grass grow on the hills. He gives to the beasts their food and to the young ravens that cry. His delight is not in the strength of the horse nor his pleasure in the legs of a man. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him in those whose hope is in his steadfast love. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Your open hand, O Lord, you satisfy the desire of every living thing. Heavenly Father, though we do not deserve your goodness, still you provide for all our needs of body and soul. Grant us your Holy Spirit that we may acknowledge your gifts 
give thanks for all your benefits and serve you in willing obedience. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Please be seated for the readings. The Old Testament reading is taken from the prophet Jeremiah, chapter 23, verses 1 to 6. Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pasture, declares the Lord. Therefore, thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, concerning the shepherds who care for my people, you have scattered my flock and have driven them away, and you have not attended to them. Behold, I will attend to you for your evil deeds, declares the Lord. Then I will gather the remnant of my flock out of all the countries where I have driven them, and I will bring them back to their fold, and they shall be fruitful and multiply. I will set shepherds over them who will care for them, and they shall no longer fear nor be dismayed, neither shall any be missing, declares the Lord. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up for David a righteous branch, and he shall reign as king and deal wisely and shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. In his days, Judah will be saved and Israel will dwell securely. And this is the name by which he will be called. The Lord is our righteousness. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. The epistle reading is taken from Paul's letter to the church in Ephesus, chapter 2. Therefore, remember that at one time you Gentiles in the flesh called the uncircumcision, by which is called the circumcision, which is made in the flesh by hands. Remember that you were at a time separated from Christ, alienated from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers to the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility. By abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances, that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace, and might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, therefore thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to you who are near, for through him we both have access in one spirit to the Father. So then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone, in whom the whole structure, being joined together, grows in a holy temple in the Lord. In him you also are being built together into a dwelling place for God, by the Spirit. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please rise for the gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Mark, the sixth chapter. The apostles returned to Jesus and told him all that they had done and taught. And he said to them, come away by yourselves to a desolate place and rest for a while. For many were coming and going, and they had no leisure even to eat. And they went away in a boat to a desolate place by themselves. Now many saw them going and recognized them, and they ran there on foot from all the towns and got there ahead of them. When he went ashore, he saw a great crowd and he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. And he began to teach them many things. And when it grew late, his disciples came to him and said, this is a desolate place and the hour is now late. Send them away to go into the surrounding countryside and villages and buy themselves something to eat. But he answered them, you give them something to eat. And they said to him, shall we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? And he said to them, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. 
And when they had found out, they said, five and two fish. Then he commanded them all to sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups by hundreds and fifties. And taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and said a blessing and broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples to set before the people. And he divided the two fish among them all. And they all ate and were satisfied. And they took up 12 baskets full of broken pieces and of the fish. And those who ate the loaves were 5,000 men. This is the gospel of the Lord. We continue with our common confession of faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. We confess together. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary and was made man and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried, and the third day he rose again according to the scriptures and ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshiped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. You know, one of the great legacies that we have coming out of Luther's Reformation is the idea that the governing body, the political governing body, and the church governing body should be absolutely separate. It's where we get that very commonly spoken notion of separation between church and state. 
Some have also argued that if it weren't for Luther's Reformation, the United States would never have existed. But that's a discussion for another time. Well, you have to remember that in Luther's day, there was no separation between church and state. The Roman Empire was coming out of, or the, the Roman Catholic Church was coming out of the Roman Empire. And so the idea is that the church and the government were one and the same. Now, there was a time in the history of the Bible where God did want that, and that was appropriate, and he designed it that way. Remember that God, after he had led the people out of slavery into the wilderness, and then he brought them to the promised land, he brought them into the promised land under the guidance of Joshua, and he gave them leaders. He gave them shepherds. He gave them people who were there on behalf of God. And so the governing bodies, in other words, the political bodies that were there for the people of Israel, were the exact same leaders that were there to take care of them spiritually. That's what Jeremiah is talking about in chapter 23, where he says, I'm coming to hold you accountable, shepherds, over Israel and Judah, because you've dropped the ball. You're not doing what you're supposed to be doing for the people of Israel. And we see how they failed in a couple of very important ways. First of all, remember, here comes the Israelites. They're coming out of the wilderness into the promised land. And what does God tell them? God tells the leaders of the Israelites to make sure as you come into the promised land, you're going to encounter people when you get there. There are some people who are already in your land. And he said, these people are pagans. They're not believers. They are idol worshipers. And he said, you go in and you clear all of them out. Every single one. You put them to the sword and you get rid of them. Now, why is that? That is because God knew that the people had a sinful nature. And were they to come into the promised land and have all of this exposure to false religions, they would be in spiritual danger. The temptation to believe the religious groups of those people living in the promised land. And so he said, get them out for that reason. Now, is that what the leadership of the Israelites did? No, that's not what they did. In fact, they moved in, they moved some of the people out, but there were still many false religions there. And God predicted exactly what would happen. Many of the kings went right into idol worship. They led the people in idol worship. They built Asherah poles, and they built statues to Baal, and all sorts of false worship, and they led people in that direction. So when God comes along and he says, you know what, leaders, you shepherds of the people of Israel, you have failed because you've scattered everybody, and you've left them into temptation. You're not doing your job. Recently, in my Bible study, my personal time in the Bible, I've been reading through First and Second Kings and Chronicles. And as you read through those, I've been taking an inventory of all the kings of Israel and Judah. And there are a couple of kings that really knock it out of the park, like Jehu and Asa and Josiah. Excellent work. But most of them, overwhelmingly, were evil. They were evil because... They married into families of idol worshipers. They worshiped Baal, and they set up churches and encouraged the people of Israel to worship gods away from the one true God. And it's a sad story. And that is where we see that those folks have failed. And so when God comes along and he says, you know what? You didn't attend to my people. You leaders, you shepherds, you kings, you prophets, you didn't attend to my people. So God says, I'm going to attend to you. And those are difficult words. But what did he do? If you read those passages in First and Second Kings, it talks about how there was a good king who would come along, and he not only put the evil king to the sword, but also his whole family and all of his children. In other words, God said, you are a good king. You come and you wipe out this evil king and his whole dynasty. God did attend to them. Now, we don't know if they, where they spent eternity. We don't know where they are. But we do know that God was serious about it and expected them to shepherd their people correctly. Now, of course, it happens in our day as well. 
it happens in our day as well, where we see shepherds, pastors, who are not doing what they are supposed to do. Now, all pastors fail, absolutely. And I count myself right up there at the top of the heap of pastors who don't always do what they're supposed to be teaching. But the main issue here, remember we talked about the idol worship and the false gods and the false teachings and all of those things of the Old Testament. We recognize today that there are Christian teachers that absolutely, without hesitation, preach Jesus Christ. They preach Jesus and salvation purely in Jesus Christ. But in many cases, we find that there are Christian churches and Christian pastors who are teaching falsely on many of the other issues, on things like, how does a person become a Christian? Who is Jesus Christ? What will happen when Jesus returns? What is baptism all about? What is Holy Communion all about? What is supposed to happen in worship? And we find that there are false teachings about those things all over the place. Now, of course, we react to that and we say, hey, you know what, why is it so important that we be so particular? Why be so particular about these teachings in the Bible? Well, remember that your Bible is about this thick or maybe thicker, depending on how your eyes are doing right now and how many little references you have in your Bible. If all God wanted us to know was that Jesus Christ died on the cross and that we have salvation through him, it would just be John 3.16 on a little business card. And that would be our whole Bible and how easy that would be to just stuff in our wallet and you got the whole God's word right there. But we have God's word from Genesis to Revelation. And that means that everything in that Bible, God wants us to know, to understand, and to be correct about. That's the key issue of the point that we're making here, to be correct about. Now, let me give you a couple of examples to drive that point home. Let's say that I go to the doctor for my checkup, and the doctor has all this information he wants to share with me about my blood work. And I say to the doctor, Doc, look, just tell me, am I going to be alive tomorrow? Well, yeah. Okay, well, I don't need to hear anything else. I don't want to hear about how my organs are doing, about how my blood work is, my cholesterol, my lipids, or anything else. Just give me the bottom line. But we do that all the time with Christianity. Just give me the bottom line about Jesus, but don't tell me anything else. You might also ask yourself, those of you who are married, how many of your wedding vows would you like your spouse to hold up and to pay attention to? As long as you don't commit adultery, that's fine. Everything else is really up for grabs, right? I mean, adultery is really the key issue there. You see the point that I'm trying to make. In every other realm of life, we expect absolute perfection. We want people to follow things to the letter of the law. But with Christianity, we're willing to throw everything out and hold on just to Jesus because we're afraid that holding on to those teachings will push people away. But we recognize, no, we are to be correct. We are to be correct about everything. Well, you know, my sixth grade teacher, um, Mr. Carl Teese, who I respect greatly, he had a number of sayings that he used to use while I was in sixth grade. And one of them was cruising for a bruising, cruising for a bruising. And he said that to me a few times, right? Uh, he would say, Mr. Rigdon, you are cruising for a bruising. Now, this was not during a lesson on English poetry. It was instead his way of saying that the next step is big trouble and you don't want to go there, right? You don't want to go there. He also used to say that, Mr. Rigdon, you're on the hot seat. You're on the hot seat. Now, what does that mean? In other words, is that attention is being placed on you, that you're culpable. You're the one who is in trouble right now, and you can't put the attention on anybody else. You see, as Christians, it would be very easy for us to say, you know, the reason that I am where I'm at in my spiritual life is because, you know what, the leaders in my life, the spiritual leaders in my life haven't done their job. You know, my past pastors really didn't do a good job of shepherding, and that's why I'm at where I'm at right now. You know what, the things that I've read, the books that I've read, they weren't really correct, and so that's where I'm at right now. It's not really my fault, but it is. God held the people accountable even though he also held 
their shepherds to be accountable. One way to look at that is this, when we talk about those issues of correct and false teaching. What is your standard for a church and a pastor? How do you decide what your standard is for a church and a pastor? When you decide to yourself, you know what, here's why I'm at St. John, or here's why I used to worship over here. Here's what I liked about this pastor, and here's what I didn't really care so much for about this pastor pastor. Maybe it's something you think, you know what, well, the pastor that I like, or the pastors that I like, they're really interesting, they're kind, they're fun to be with, they're good listeners, they're good administrators, they write good Bible studies, all of those things. And if they're generally correct about what the Bible says, that's great. But these other things are much more important. Or when you decide for yourself what sort of church you are going to go to, you know what? What I'm really looking for is a church that has a jungle gym and that has a great Starbucks-like coffee display and that's doing lots of other sorts of mission activities and all sorts of wonderful things and has friendly, welcoming people. And I hope that they're generally correct about what they teach in the Bible, but if not, the other stuff is far more important. Now, do you see where I'm coming from about that? What should be our standard when choosing a church and a pastor? The exact inversion of that. I should first say to myself, is that pastor teaching the truth? And does he so, do so regularly? And does this church teach correctly, regularly? And then everything else should be there too. But after I check this other stuff off. But we see that people miss that and they go along, they go in the wrong direction all the time. You see, when we get to heaven, there aren't going to be any excuses. When I stand before the Lord on Judgment Day and he asks me why I, I should be led into heaven, what am I going to say? Am I going to say, well, I don't know Jesus Christ, but it's not my fault. It's not my fault because my father and my mother weren't very good examples to me of the faith. It's because they never took me to Sunday school. It's because, you know what, I never had time to read the Bible because I was so busy with other things. There wasn't a church nearby that I could go to. None of those things will work. What God will be concerned about is he's going to say, you know what, I tried to reach out to you. I tried to give you the Bible. I encouraged you to read it. I encouraged you to come to church, but you wouldn't have it. You see, the Lord wants us to be correct, and he wants us to have those things that he is bringing to us. One of the things that I've been working on at home um, in the backyard is we have a patch of clovers that uh, is in the back there. And so what I've done in the last few weeks is pull all the clovers out of the ground. And of course, then you have this really, uh, you know, black mud that's underneath that. And so what do I do when I start digging up the mud and just to see what's underneath there? The, the shovel goes clink, clink, and you find out what's underneath there rocks. There are rocks underneath there and big rocks underneath there. And I have no idea why, because they're not attractive, any sort of decorative rocks. They're just big rocks. And so what do I do? I'm down there in the dirt, digging these rocks out, and then I gather them all up into a big pile, and I take them down to our little, uh, I don't know, what is it, a gully or a ravine or something like that, where we have all the other rocks, and I put them there. But I had to gather them all up. And I had to move them. And I think finally, I got them all taken care of. Well, God says in the passage from Jeremiah, how he is going to gather his flock to himself, the people of Judah, the people of Israel. He's going to gather them back together. Because remember what happened. The Assyrians and then the Babylonians came in and they took all the people out and they took them back to Assyria and Babylon. And they were lost. They were gone. And so God says, you know what, shepherds, even though you didn't do what you were supposed to, I'm going to gather my people back. I'm going to bring them back to myself. And that's exactly what he does. He gathers the people of Israel back into the promised land. He preserves that remnant as Jeremiah talks about. Now, why does he do that? Why does he do that? What's the concern? First of all, it's because he loves the people of Israel, just like he loves you and me. And most importantly, 
Remember that God said that the Savior, the righteous branch, Jesus Christ, would come from no other group than the people of Israel. Jesus had to preserve the people of Israel in order that one day, descending from King David, that Jesus Christ, the righteous branch, who would come and work in wisdom and righteousness and execute justice in the land, would come into the world and be our Savior. And that same Jesus Christ then comes and he gathers us around himself. If you look at the gospel lesson for today from Mark chapter 6, it talks about the feeding of the 5,000, these people who were so hungry. And what did Jesus do? Did he say, hey, you know what, you 5,000 families here, I want you to come forward, but only the Jews. That's all I want, just the Jews. Or did he say, hey, you know what, I only want the Gentiles to come forward and to come for this wonderful meal. No, he says that I have gathered you unto myself. And what he is talking to is he's saying that I have gathered my children. That's you and me to himself. And what does he gather us for? To feed us on himself, to give us himself, not only in the word that we are celebrating right now, but also in his true body and blood. When the Lord calls us to his table here soon to receive Holy Communion, he is saying, come to me. He's saying, examine yourselves and recognize your sin and recognize the true body and blood of my son here in this sacrament and then come to the altar to be fed. God has called us to himself and he will do so one day again when he returns, when he will call us either from the earth or from the grave and gather us as one family, that remnant, into heaven. In Jesus' name, amen. And now may the peace of God that passes all understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus unto life eternal. Amen. As we continue with uh, the offering, and again, the plate is back there in the back for the offerings, and we'll stand then for the offertory. continue with the prayers of the church. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, for your compassion shown in Christ Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep and the righteous son of David. Keep us trusting at all times in your right hand, in whom true satisfaction is found. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, that you have built one holy church on the foundation of the apostles and prophets with Christ Jesus as our cornerstone. Grant unity to your church on earth through the work of your Holy Spirit and the faithful proclamation of Christ's reconciling cross. As you tore down the dividing wall of hostility between Jew and Gentile in Christ, so heal all divisions of doctrine or pride on earth, even as your church is one before your throne. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, that you have brought us from many families into the household of God. Continue to bless all Christian homes, the fathers, the mothers, that fathers and mothers may faithfully lead their children by word and deed to call upon you as Father. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, for our nation and its leaders. We ask your blessing on those who serve in civil office, that we may enjoy good government in accord with your commandments. Help us to live in service to our neighbors while here, mindful that our true citizenship is in heaven. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, for your constant care and all we need to support this body and life. 
Attend in mercy those who are in need among us. Especially this evening, we pray for Karen Bloom, who has been hospitalized and is struggling with various health issues. Use doctors and nurses and medication to bring her healing, to control her pain. Protect her from despair and sadness, and instead fill her with the joy of the Savior. We pray as well, dear Lord, for the family and friends of Jean Cook. We thank you for the life that she had here on earth, and also for what you did for her on the cross. We thank you now also that her pain in this world is gone, and she instead is with you in heaven, experiencing your full presence, and also being reunited with her husband, Jim. Dear Lord, we also pray for that family, that they would be protected from undue grief, but instead that that grief would be assuaged with the certainty of seeing Jean again in heaven. Free, from, free them from dismay, free them from dismay and fear by the certainty that Christ is their righteousness. We give thanks to you, Heavenly Father, for Jesus Christ, God's Son, our Savior, who by his death has made satisfaction for our sins. Grant faith to all who come to his holy supper today that we may eat his true body from the for, for the forgiveness of sins and be satisfied unto life everlasting. All these things and, one, and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. We continue on page 194, page 194 in our hymnals with the service of the sacrament. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks unto the Lord our God. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should at all times, in all places, give thanks to you, Holy Lord, Almighty Father, everlasting God, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who, having created all things, took upon human flesh and was born of the Virgin Mary. For our sake he died on the cross and rose from the dead to put an end to death, thus fulfilling your will and gaining for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven, we laud and magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and saying, pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to the disciples, saying, Take and eat. 
This is my body given for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same way also he took the cup after supper. When he had given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink of it, all of you. This cup is the New Testament in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. This do as often as you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always. seated and welcome to the table of the Lord. Yep. Come on down. Take and eat the true body of Christ given for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink the true blood of Jesus shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat the true body of Christ given for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink the true blood of Jesus shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat the true body of Christ given for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink the true blood of Jesus shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat the true body of Christ given for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink blood of Jesus shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat the true body of Christ given for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. The true blood of Jesus shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat the true body of Christ given for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink the true blood of Jesus shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and eat the true body of Christ given for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. The true blood of Jesus shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Tim, take and eat the true body of Christ given for you. Take and drink the true blood of Jesus shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Mary, take and eat the true body of the Lord given for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Take and drink the true blood of Jesus shed for you for the forgiveness of all of your sins. Sandy, take and eat the true body of Jesus given for you
Please rise. And now may this true body and blood of your Lord and Savior Jesus Christ keep and preserve you in the one true faith unto life eternal. Your sins are forgiven. Go in his peace and his joy. Amen. Give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. Let us pray. We give thanks to you, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us through this salutary gift, and we implore you that of your mercy you would strengthen us through the same in faith toward you and in fervent love toward one another. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. The Lord be with you. Bless we the Lord. The Lord 
Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace.
better to drink. Yeah. 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 Yeah.